you kick it off. You want me to kick it off? Yeah. Ready? Are you rolling? We are live. Matt Best, Jamie Caldwell. How you doing, sir? Good. Really good. It's uh, awesome to be in Texas. It's just like a nice little uh, Texas fall day today. It's like 68 degrees. We have some hot black rifle coffee. Man, I am... This is a good day, Logan. It, it cooled down a little bit, and uh, Jamie was up in up north a little bit in Dallas area. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, Fort, Fort Worth. Yeah, and you're doing a bunch of training up there, right? Yeah, doing right? some rifle pistol stuff, doing some MBG training. And uh, yeah, it was it was a hot weekend. Saturday and Sunday was 90 degrees on the range. So this kind of cool morning is very nice. I feel like if I owned a, a training company, I would just shut it down from about May to like September in Texas because it's so fucking hot out here. <laughs> That's when you start heading north. Yeah. 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 So you almost like kind of the fishing tournament trail. We, you know, start off down south in the in the early part of the year where it's nice out, go down yeah. Florida, Texas, and then try to work your way north. Exactly. So the weather stays nice. Yeah. Well, dude, you, yeah, you're a really interesting guy, like super interesting. You and I'm not being facetious. Like your your backstory, you're a special operations veteran, and you're a professional fisherman, and you're a your business owner. I mean, you got a lot going on, and I think it's inspiring for a lot. You, you make me feel lazy, and not a lot of people do that. So I'm super <laughs> intrigued to to chat with you, man. Yeah, I uh, I've got quite a few irons in the pot. Um, I don't, I just I can't sit still. That's it. I mean, I yeah between. Like you said, uh, 21 years in special operations. I mean, I started off Ranger Regiment with a Ranger contract. Uh, of course, first bat, best bat. Right. I yeah. do I do see your hat. It says ACO. I was an ACO 275. You're ACO 175. Yeah. So we you know, uh, a little competitiveness there. Yeah. At least definitely. we're not 375. Though. Why, no, yeah. why yeah, yeah, is that yeah. the can't. best bat? Because I always thought it was second. It's, it's whatever bat you're in, right? Exactly. exactly of Except course. for third. Everybody who's in third is like, no, no nobody, nobody wants right. to be at Fort Benning. <laughs> you have to go through, you have to, you're in Fort Benning for all of your training. You want to get the hell out of there. The last yeah. place you want to be stationed and living now for seven, eight years, however long you're going to stay there is the same place you did yeah. basic and jump school and rip. Well, now they call it RASP. RASP yeah. yeah. I think it's probably in between the two, right? If you agree on this, you have 275, it's up in, you know, Fort Lewis or JBLM now in Tacoma. So you're yeah. like super far away from the flagpole. So it's kind of up to the local yeah, a little, leadership. A little bit more own program. Yeah, maybe there. just, you know, yeah. but then you got Savannah, Georgia, where 175 is and Savannah is a dope ass town. And then 375, as, as great as they are, they're there with the, t the flagpole with 70 fifth ranger regiment so you're at you're at the flagpole where all the brass ah, is at you, you got more eight more e8s and e9s telling gotcha. you which way to tie your shoes and wear <laughs> yeah. your hat and stay off the grass yeah, yeah so savannah <laughs> savannah was uh, savannah was beautiful i loved it i mean i you're in savannah georgia you're on hunter army airfield which is a tiny little base and once you leave that base it's like you're a civilian again so you, as soon as you step out into the world i mean you don't see Joe anywhere. You very rarely see uniforms. Uh, and the weather is beautiful. I mean, uh, it's, it's Savannah, it's the beach. Uh, I mean, I guess we kind of had a nickname as the beach boys, us wearing our Oakleys around and you guys were pretty much just wearing your raincoats and yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we're like the weather in Washington never knows if it needs to rain or like not. It's always just misty and sprinkly. I, I forget. I think I forget that because like at you know two seven five, you have the huge base there. So everywhere you go, it's military guys. And luckily, when I was in, we had the more relaxed haircut. So we kind of I'm a civilian, and girls were like, thank God, military guys. Ew. I'm like, yeah, ew. <laughs> uh, pull out my driver's license instead of my cat card. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's. I tell you, that's one of the things that I, I sort of liked about when I went to Bragg. So after I finished my time at 175, I went to selection to go to the unit and um, got to the unit. And then it was pretty much like, no, you need to be a civilian. You need to look like a civilian. And a majority of us lived on the backside of post, which is a golf community. So living around that Pinehurst, Southern Pines area, you yeah. didn't see Joe anymore because Fayetteville, they're everywhere. I yeah. mean, you can't, even in the middle of the night, you go walk into the grocery store to go get something, some more beer maybe or whatever. And there's there's Joe in his uniform. I mean, you can't get away from it. Those on the tights other are side high. Yeah. All those high and tights down there. Oh yeah, it, it was bad. But you know, now that Fort Bragg has grown so much because I'm still there, uh, retire out of there after being there for so long. You just kind of roots are dug in, but more and more of them have figured that out and the base has grown. So now there's a 
ton of Joes all over Southern Pines area. So you can't get away from it. I feel like it's that nice kept secret of Southern Pines because uh, shout out to Southern Pines Brewery. I love those guys. Great beer over there. But I feel like it's it was a little nice kept secret. And then the Joe slowly yeah. getting out there and you're like, dang it, man. This was because every time I'd go visit Bragg, that was what I would do. I'd go up to Southern Pines and just chill up there because it's such a low key town. I love it. Yeah, it is. It's nice. I mean, the the a lot of guys stay at the Jefferson Inn, which is right there in downtown. So you got all the different bars and breweries, O'Donnell's. Um, yeah, you can you can just walk to anything and it's it's kind of a cool old hotel. So really nice place to stay versus your typical Marriott's and Hilton's or whatever that are there. Yeah. Sure. But it's a great it's a great town. I, I love it. And uh still there, stuck there. Um I'd love to be a little further south. I I I grew up in New England, but I can't stand the winter. I hate the cold. I'm the same way. Like I grew up in Michigan and I'm like, I've done enough of that. <laughs> I don't need to participate in frigid w winters anymore. Hence why I live in Texas now. Yeah. Well, it's true, right? Everybody makes fun of Texas. We're just bullshitting right now. We'll get into your backstory, but it, it's like everybody, it's like, oh, Texas, it's too hot. And then come November, it's like 60 degrees oh, and we're loving perfect. life and everybody else is freezing their dicks off, you know, plowing snow and stuff. I'm like, good on you, buddy. I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm you in a light sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in like a Lululemon sweater. <laughs> That's great. But yeah. I, so I have a question for you. We're in there and we're starting talking about fishing a little bit and you got this like, this passion and light up in your eyes and coming from your background of all the cool guy stuff you did, was that always something you wanted to do or is it just an outlet during when you served that became a profession? Because you're obviously super passionate about it. And I love when people talk about their craft, whether it's art or fishing or whatever the fuck, and you just lit up about it. And yeah, I'm like, oh, that's, yeah. that's cool, man. It is. It's, I, it's, it's multiple things. I mean, it, it just started off as it was my hobby. It was kind of, you know, I don't know, a niche. Um, I just, I always loved it. I just always enjoyed it since I was a kid. I mean, I started fishing since, since I can remember. I mean, I got pictures of me standing there with a new little fishing pole at Christmas or something all lit up, you know? Um, but I, I grew up fishing, you know, in New England and I, and I fished for whatever. I mean, I didn't care. It wasn't just, I was going after bass. I mean, I, whatever would tug on the end of the line. That's, sure. that was cool to me. Yeah. Um, as I got a little bit older, like high school, my grandfather got into fly fishing or was into fly fishing through some part of his life, made his own fly rod. So gave me, and I still have it. I want to get a nice frame done oh, on it cool. and hang it's it at the new house. Yeah. yeah. But he gave me a fly rod that he made. And then he gave me all his fly tying gear. He had a full vice and, you know, all these different feathers and hackle and all these yeah. stuff and, and taught me how to fly fish. And for anybody that's, I'm sure most guys have seen it, but it's, Fly fishing is an art in itself. I mean, just yeah. the cast and the presentation and trout are, I mean, trout are, they're hard to catch. I mean, especially if they get on a hatch. So there's a, you know, certain hatch of bugs. If you don't match it exactly, you're not going to catch them. I mean, they'll come up and look at it. They got very good eyesight and that water's clear. So they'll come up, look at it and then just turn right away. And nothing's more frustrating than right. watching a fish come to your bait. And then- Don't you nothing. have to wear like camo in some trout fishing because they look through the clear water and it, see you and it they'll spook them? It's almost like hunting, you know? And That's I mean, great. we all love to hunt, but you, you're stalking some of these fish, especially, I mean, I enjoyed not the big, huge trout streams and rivers. It was, it was the backwater stuff, you know, going after native trout that- grew there, live there, not, you know, hatchery fish that are just dumb and they'll eat anything. I mean, you've got to stalk them because they'll, they'll feel, I mean, just like any animal, they'll feel your presence in the area, whether you're walking next to the creek, sure. I they mean, you can think feel about that it, it's vibration. Like, oh, they, they only, they have so much vision as far as, you know, you're typically in shallow water in a, yeah. or more shallow water in a river. And then all of a sudden this, this big shadowy figure is just standing over a hole. Like it, it's pretty obvious. Oh yeah. And then even that. when you're in the water fishing, cause a lot of times, you know, fly fishing, you're standing in the creek. Yeah, so you always want to work your way upstream, you know, that way, whatever you're stepping on and making rock and, you know, making noise or making dust and dirt, it's going down that right. way. So you're heading up into the clean water. So I, I, I got into fly fishing and then once I got in the military, I was, I was still into fly fishing, but I got stationed at 175. So I was in Savannah, Georgia, and you got to drive four hours to Dahlonega into the mountains to get any trout. So that wasn't happening very often. Um, I got into bass fishing while I was, while I was down there and, and enjoyed that. I mean, it was, it's similar cause you're targeting that one species and you know, they're not that easy to catch. So certain baits and changing up all my, all my tackle. And I actually, I ended up not the stuff my grandfather gave me, but 
all the other stuff I had bought for fly fishing, I sold it to a buddy and was like, I'm diving in head first on all this bass fishing yeah. gear, rods, reels, the you know, new tackle, everything that I needed. And I was fishing a bunch, just local ponds, anything I could find. And and then a local guy that I was fishing with some told me I needed to join a bass club. And I mean, this is this is like mid nineties, early nineties. I'm like, I don't even know what the heck that was, you know, no idea. So he he introduced me like to one of the guys. It sounds a little gay to you. What's Bass Club? <laughs> the Bass Club. I mean, that's cool and all, Heck but yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the RC Club at school. Yeah. And yeah. The, yeah. Um, so I joined this club and fished my first tournament. And that right there was where it lit up for me. I'm like, okay. Add a little bit of competition to the formula, and then all of a yes. sudden, the it came on. so you start off your racing boats. So we're talking about, you know, at that time, 60 to 70 miles an hour in a boat and you're oh, yeah. racing to get to your spot because somebody else might want to get there too, yeah. you know? So you're trying to beat this dude. So there's a race competition. Now you got money involved. So you're trying to win money. You've thrown some money into a pot, you know, to, to try to compete. And then you're competing against these fish and the other guys. And it was like, man, this is awesome. I mean, the adrenaline that goes into it, you're out there fishing for eight hours, trying to beat the snot out of everybody and trying to outsmart these fish and win some money, run around and race a boat for a little while. I mean, it's it's fun. It's a good time. I feel like a guy with your background, if I was there, I probably would have been like pulling up GRGs and like overlays and been like, all right, I'm going to outsmart all the civilians on this. And <laughs> I've done that. Five, five, <laughs> yeah, of course you have, right? Like yeah, yeah. Five paragraph op order of like how you're going to do the whole freaking fishing day. And everybody else is like, I'm just here to hang out and have a good competitive day. You're like, I'm fucking taking you down, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. You hit the nail on the head. So I, I have had written notes like on the windshield and the inside windshield of my boat. Like, all right, here's spot one I'm going to. How long I'm going to stay there? Then spot two, three, four. You know, and you, I'd get, usually have about six or seven places. And then you sort of let the fish tell you, you know, what's happening. Because if you're not catching them at this place or that place, or you need to tweak some things like, all right, well, it doesn't make sense to go to this offshore spot because they're not eaten offshore yet, you know, there's shallow fish are biting. So you sort of branch out and have a plan. But there was one rotation in Iraq where we had a little bit of downtime and I may have gone to our Intel guys with a couple of grid coordinates <laughs> and been like, hey, I need some one meter imagery on these places. And they're like, they knew it was me. They're like, yeah, okay, hold on, just give us a few minutes. We'll have some stuff for you. I'm like, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it, it just, it, it's been a passion of mine says the kid, and then the tournament aspect. And then, I mean, what really got me even more juice the next time was I saw that guys were doing this and making a living at it. You know, it was like, it wasn't just, okay, it's fun. I mean, I enjoy it because it's fun. I enjoy it because it's a stress relief. It's getting out in nature, um, the competition aspect. But then I saw that guys are making good money at this. I mean, in its heyday, and it's, and it's getting back there. I mean, some of the top level guys, I mean, they're making anywhere and it's, and it's a wide range depending on how good their marketing skills are but anywhere from 500,000 to a couple million dollars a year wow bass fishing now that's you that, know that's, that's not just tournament winnings yeah exactly wings, the yeah, sponsorship aspect of yeah. it you know the the endorsements the getting your your name and your face on a product and you know now you're getting a cut of everything that's sold i mean there's a ton of ways to go about it and what is like a for the tournaments you got found yourself into the the winnings. Like what is a, a winner typically getting? So it price? varies on the trail because there's so many different levels. Yeah. So I've fished the highest level. I've fished FLW Tour and I've fished some Bass Elite events. Those are a hundred to $125,000 first place. That's well, not a bad prize package at all. That's not bad at all. Yeah. But I imagine it's hyper competitive. I think from an oh, outsider view, you'd be like, you bass fish, you're like, no, you got to have the boat. You got to have the sonar. You have to know the freaking lake or the whatever. I mean, yeah. you've got, yeah, it helps to have all the right gear, which isn't cheap at all. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's at the top level, it's a rich man sport. It yeah. really is. Without sponsors, if you were just to jump in and pay your own way, you're going to spend, I mean, the year I fished FLW Tour, just the entry fees alone was $53,000 for one season. That's like eight events. And that you're already, I mean, you've got, we, I think I had already paid because you pay an installment. You can pay it all up front. I didn't have that money to pay it up front. Um, you pay in installments. And by the time we made our first cast at the first event, I'd already was, was already in, you know, in the whole 
25 grand or something. Damn. Yeah. Mm. So now you're- Pressure's on. It is. But here's, so here's what I've done. And here's what I tell a lot of guys that either are in high school, because now we have, it, the sport has grown so much. You've got junior leagues. So kids literally in elementary school and middle school can start fishing bass tournaments competitively against, you know, others. High school, it's gotten very big. So there's, there's high school teams now. Hmm. There's scholarships you can get. College, it's huge in college. That's kind of the first level that it started at you know, when it left the level it is now is college got started, then high school got started. And now you have like these juniors doing it too. Um, but the guys that are coming out and want to do this or, or think they want to do this for a living is try to get sponsors, get sponsors as quick as you can. Um, just getting your toe in the door with a company and then proving yourself to what you can do for that company, how, how you can help them in that market space. You know, you got to get creative. You got to be different than every other guy that's knocking on every one of those doors to say, Hey, sponsor me, sponsor me. But you want to get those sponsors so that you can end up turning them into cash sponsors so that they're paying yeah. you so that now you can utilize that money to pay your way to fish, whether it's, you know, a boat sponsor is helping you get your boat at a discount. You know, you obviously need something to tow it with, but you have to have all your rods, reels, your tackle, you got to get your entry fees covered, your gas, your lodging. So getting those expenses covered. And that's, you know, when I finally got to that level, I had sponsors that were paying my way. So it wasn't taking anything out of my pocket. So I could fish stress-free. You know, if I, if I cashed a check in a tournament, it was a bonus. You know, it was like, hey, cool. I made some money this week. But if right. I didn't, I wasn't taking food off the table. And I told my wife when, when she, you know, after, even while I was active duty, I was fishing professionally. But, you know, that was my plan when I retired. I was like, hey, I want to do this full time and, and really give it, give it my all. And she was all behind it. But I had promised her and told her, I was like, look, if, if this, if I'm fishing to put food on the table, right. forget it. I'll just go back to fishing local and just having fun with it and competing yeah. on the local scene. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not going to put that stress on me, on us, on our family. You know, is it because it's, there's a lot, I mean, there's, there's plenty of dudes out there that are doing it with second mortgages on their houses. I mean, it's, the sport looks so glamorous from the outside, but if you dove in on the inside and looked at half the guys that are fishing it, you, you'd well, be like, what? it's probably very, uh, um, in line with like mixed martial arts in the sense of people are like, Oh, you're a prize fighter. You must, you made $20,000 for one fight. Well, these guys are fighting once or twice. That's $40,000 a year. Right. And then their, their coach fees and their training fees. And then if you get injured and it's just the same thing, like maybe you didn't catch the biggest bass and you had to be completely reliant on prize money. It would, it would definitely be a tax on the old psycho psychology. Yeah, definitely. So sponsors help. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, and I'm, Hey, shout out to Black Rifle Coffee Company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're taking yeah. care of me. Yeah. yeah. Sponsor, so you do great work, man. And uh yeah. or logo on your boat looks awesome. Yeah. Heck yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah. And you just finished up doing all the uh we're doing this big outdoor giveaway, which if people have been watching this on YouTube, you see Jamie is the one doing the whole spiel as far as what all is entailed in there. And we were putting together a social promo recently for for it and I was like looking at what type of boat it is. And I'm like, I don't have any idea what any of that means, but it seems like it's a top of the line, high end bass boat. That Yeah. So that. we've, um, I mean, I appreciate you guys bringing me in on that whole thing. I'm super excited about it. And I was able to reach out to a bunch of my sponsors and, and tell them about it. Hey, let's get in on this to make sure everything was outfitted. And whoever wins this package is, is getting a killer setup. Yeah. It's like 110 K. Yeah. It's yeah. fucking oh, epic. It's, oh, it sweet. is. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, I'm telling everybody I know, you know, Hey, make sure you sign up for this. Make sure you sign up for this. But the bass boat is a, uh, Sabre FDD. So it's a, it's a bass cat boat, which is what I fish. I've, I've been fishing bass cat boats for about a little over 15 years now, competitively. Absolutely love it. The company is amazing. They're out of Mountain Home, Arkansas, just down the road from a handful of other big name boat companies um, in the industry. But they've been making boats since the early 70s. Um, they know what they're doing and they and they build a phenomenal boat. But the in the contest is an 18 foot. So it's a Sabre um, FTD full, full team uh, deck. So nice wide boat. It's got a uh, Mercury on the back of it. It's got some power poles on it. It's got all Hummingbird electronics, Minn Kota Ultrax trolling motor. I mean, basically what these things are is going to help you find the fish 
super clear, crisp when you're riding around, you can see, hey, there's a fish, there's a rock pile on all your electronics. And then that trolling motor is going to get you to where you need to go. And I mean, one of the big things about it is it has a feature called spot lock. So when we get on an area to fish, you know, you want to stay there, make a bunch of casts, but you don't, if the winds blow in or there's current in the place that you're fishing, you're constantly with a foot on the trolling motor and trying to keep the boat in a position. You just hit a button and GPS it locks you Shut right on that spot. Yeah, really? you don't so have to do it's, nothing. You it's just like fit. communicating wow, so to cool. the motor to. So it, counter- yeah, so it the G, the yep. So it's got its own GPS locator on there, and then it tells the trolling motor, okay. And it, I mean, it's tight. It doesn't let you vary oh, but a couple gnarly. feet. So as you as the wind's blowing, and I don't care how hard the wind's blowing, how hard the current is, the trolling motor ramps up, and it and it just keeps you right in that area. So now you just concentrate on fishing. That's it. That's phenomenal because I'm always used to being on a boat, and it's like you start to drift. And then the, oh, the guy's cussing, running over, hitting the troll motor to get you back and then trying to get the cast in. Yeah, that's yep. super yeah, cool. Yeah, it makes it easy. It's not, nice. not to be adverty here, but where do people go to uh, sign up for that? Because I'm sure people are going to be like, I um, want that it's boat. It's super easy. I can't remember that, but you basically have to text a number and then you're automatically entered. It's... Oh, there we go. Dave will put it up in the bottom. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. So on, on what was the allure to be punny um, of of going after bass? Is, is it just how intricate you have to be to catch them because bass fishing can be very hard. It it can. I mean, bass have a brain the size of a pea, but they've outsmarted this dude plenty of times. (laughs) I'm telling you. Um, Bass is the number one sport fish. Uh, where all like the money is, where the marketing, where everything is at is, is bass. Um, Now, saltwater, there's some, I mean, I've fished in the white marlin open because I've fished professionally and competitively in saltwater also. And I mean, I've been in some and and made some good money, some big, I mean, we're talking multi-million dollar prizes in some of those events. Wow. But the entry fees are a lot more, the boat costs are a lot more, and they they just don't have that network and the exposure um, that bass does. You know, there's there's some walleye tours out there, there's crappie trails out there. So there's a lot of different game fish that have the same type of a setup, but you know, Largemouth bass, which bass, you know, largemouth spotted bass, um, smallmouth bass generally count in in most all the tournaments and every location is different with what the lake has, but it's the number one sport fish and the now, greatest the, amount of money. The popularity of that because so many people in the country can bass fish, like what is, why is it bass versus this other stuff? Yeah, so bass, it, some of those other species, you're limited to where they are and bass... Uh, it used to not be in every state. I think there might, I think it might be in every single state now because now with, because it's become so popular, most of your fishing games are like, okay, Hey, we're going to stock bass now and, um, and get, you know, cause they, they want more exposure in, in their states and their communities. Cause I, you know, you bring these big tournament trails there and this is something a lot of people don't know. Um, the top tournament trails, when they come to an area, I mean, it's not just, oh, hey, we want to go to Lake Gunnersville or we want to go down to Kissimmee Chain in Florida, you know, because it's it's going to be a good event. You know, it's January timeframe, February timeframe is usually when the trails make that sweep down there. They're getting paid. Those organizations get paid oh, yeah. by like the counties, the commissioners, you know, the because... I mean, the marketing alone, I'd imagine to know that there was like, you're watching a series on TV of bass fishing and you see these monsters coming out and you're like, that can be me. Come on, grab the boat, sweetie. We're going to floor wherever, you know? Oh yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what happens. But not to mention when you host a big tournament there, all the revenue that you're bringing in right. for the people that are spectating, the anglers, the gas, the lodging, the food, yeah. everything to be, and you're there for about a week. So, I mean, we're talking in in the multi-millions of dollars of revenue that are yeah. brought into these places. So for them to throw out $100,000 or $150,000 to the organization to bring a tournament there, the return on investment is is huge. So it's, Interesting. yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's kind of yeah. neat, but. How does it work? Because you were talking about all those things I was nodding my head to and pretending I understood on the boat. Uh, how does that work? Because I feel like there, like in any sport, there's rules and regulations, right? You couldn't just use some like sonar wave to zap the bass to the, the top of the lake. Do they have specific rule sets associated with each tournament or is it like based on the lake or the, the state? And- so every organization in the beginning of the year puts out their their rules for that trail. Um, and and they vary a little bit depending on the trail, even inside the organization. So you, when I say organization, you have BASS, which is 
pretty much been around the longest. That's like your elite series and your bass opens or your professional levels. Uh, and then you have FLW. FLW has been around for a long time. You know, they've got the FLW tour and then you've got, now they call it this year, the Toyota series, but it's their equivalent of the Bass Opens, um, another professional multi-day tournament. And then they have their kind of grassroots trail, the BFLs, which are just your weekend events, a lot more just smaller events all over the country local. Um, you also have MLF. So Major League Fishing, they have their Pro Bass Tour, and then they have a few other trails that they have. Um, and now you have another trail that just started up. That's the National Professional Fishing League. So the NPFL. And a lot of people are like, well, why do we have so many trails? You know, if all this going on, it's confusing. But if you look at what I just talked about earlier with the high school level, the college level, you know, these, these, there's more and more anglers every single year that want to fish professionally. So you've got to have venues for them to go because most of these top trails are capped. Right. Yeah. You know, there's only so many anglers once you're yeah. in, you know, then a lot I'm sure of guys they limit the teams per tournament, right? They, yeah. They limit. So per, um, Mo and it depends again on the trail, on the division, whatever it is, how many they let in. Um, Do you have to qualify but, for those, or is it more so the, like I just got money? Yeah, the top the top trails you have to qualify for. So okay. you've got to fish at kind of the semi pro level, um, finish, and everyone's a little different, but finish in like the top five or so, and then you get the invite to come to the next level. And there's you know there's plenty of guys that get the invite that turn it down just because of the expense. You know, right. all right, well, I don't have the sponsors to pay my entry fees. I'm not going to mortgage my house, you know, or I'm not ready yet um, and wait, you know, and keep competing till they're ready to go. But back on your question of rules, each one of those has slightly different rules. The majority of them are, are generally the same. Um, you know, it's, it's how you fish and only one fishing rod at a time, basically that you can kind of use, you know, one lure. There's, there's some lures out there you can't use because they have multiple lures or hooks on them. But again, every trail is a little different in what they you do. But as far as the electronics and the technology goes, you know, everything that's out there you can use, but you, yeah, you can't go out there with like some, you know, arty simulators or some, <laughs> you know, some flashbangs maybe. Some depth and, charges. And, yeah, you know? you're the old, I don't know if you remember the old RL39. So the old hand crank uh, combo telephone thing. <laughs> yeah. You put yeah. some wires in that thing will shock you. Yeah. Throw some wires in the <laughs> in the pond and crank that thing up and let some fish bubble and surface. Oh, yeah, geez, I want to yeah. yeah, I got this. Now, so here, here's a, here's something that does happen. We, we've talked about the amount of money that's in some of these tournaments, right? So of course you're going to have guys that want to cheat, right? They're like, well, why do I got to go out there and try to Imagine. catch these yeah. fish? If I cheat, hey, I'm going to just make this money. Oh, fuck. I bet people, are they like buying them at the supermarket or something and then putting them in their live well and be like, you, it must have died. Yeah. They'll, I, I, we'll go into some of the stories. I'm excited. It's, it's amazing how much in life people are willing to cheat to get ahead. And if they put half of the energy into what it took to cheat to be a professional in that capacity, they would probably be top tier. And you're just like, it took more effort cheating than it did just fucking fishing. Man. Oh, yeah. So there's, not to go into crazy all details. So the probably the most elaborate one that I've heard of recently, and this was even a couple of years ago, so some of the tournaments, they randomly put a non-boater or, or a, um, an amateur in the back of your boat. Now you're competing against each other you know, on the spot for fish, but you have different prize money. So, you know, you're not necessarily competing against that guy, you know, for winnings and for money. He's fishing against just all the other amateurs that are out of the back of the boat. But they do that randomly because you don't know who that guy is. And obviously if I go and I guys have done this, just motor my boat up to some sunken basket, yeah. pull the string and pull the basket up, which I've already preloaded with five giant bass that I caught a week ago, Right. load them and put them in my live well. Yeah. The dude's going to rat on you, you know, because right. he's like, dude, what do you do? You can't do that. It's against the rules, you know? So as soon as you get back or he's calling the tournament director saying, hey, so-and-so just did this, you're disqualified. So here's what some guy did and I think it was out of Texas, a fishing some, because Texas has got a lot of yeah. big tournament trails. You know, the more entries you get, the more money you can win. So this guy was going out pre-fishing, catching big fish. And then he would like tie them off to a piece of structure underground. So let's just say a stump. So he would tie them off to like some stump with maybe like four pound test line. So fairly light 
line and then tie it through the fish's mouth and just let the fish swim around the yeah. stump. That's all it could do. He would come in there in the tournament with a guy that in the back of the boat, he doesn't know. He just- come and snap the light pound test. Yep. He'd just start casting around till he caught the line and you can feel it when you catch the line. So he's oh, reeling, reeling, reeling. As soon as it stops, it's on the fish. You just set the hook and it snaps that lower line. Hook, the treble hooks just dig into that fish. He reels it in, flips it in and quickly, you know, undoes or cleans off the fishing line, throws it in the boat. He got caught because somebody saw him doing something suspicious on the water during like practice. They went over there, checked it, found it, called the game warden. Game wardens came out, saw it, like marked the fish. And then I think sat in the wood line during the tournament, watched the dude come Jeez. in and do it. As soon as he walked across the stage, and it was a felony charge because you're talking <laughs> sometimes, you know, 20, 30 grand in yeah. even some of these smaller tournaments yeah. that that guy would have walked off with. I mean, that's a fairly ingenious plan if you think Somebody, about it. Like put you on said, like two they pound were thinking, tests. Yeah, way with, too hard. And was there, did no one like catch him when he's got like, you know, 80 pound test on his back rod? And he's just like, no worries. <laughs> ripping the gills off the damn fish. Uh, but um, kayak fishing has become very popular. So a lot of guys okay. going out and there's tournaments now where you're out there kayak fishing, but they don't have live wells. So you can't bring those fish back in. So they have, and they, they have special rulers and you have to lay the fish on a ruler and then take a picture of it. And then you send it in or you just write it on paper. So guys were going in and they were modifying their ruler and taking a couple inches out of their ruler, putting it back <laughs> together. So then you lay the fish on it and all you see is, well, yep, the fish is touching the front of the ruler and the tail is here. You know, so you miss part of the ruler underneath the fish. And there's like, yeah, there's a few inches missing. So they go and catch a 12 inch bass, but it's not, it's a 16 inch bass on my ruler. Yeah. If what? it can be done, it will. Oh yeah, guys are gonna find a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. couldn't they just go out there and pre-fish and then take a photo and throw the bass back and say they caught it? Probably could. Yeah, I've, I haven't fished any of the kayak stuff. Um, but I, yeah, I don't. I don't know all the rules on how they <laughs> cheaters. Yeah. This is why we can't yeah. have nice things. So you know? all of these leagues, do you always know the areas you're going to be going to? Like, do you have that ability to prep and figure out? spots that you want to go to or pre-fish it and see yeah, where so these, are? So those those four trails I talked about, they'll put out their schedule and usually, they, and they're starting to trickle out right now. So in the fall, the schedules will come out for next year. Um, as the schedules come out, then, and every trail is a little different, but you do have times when you can go there and practice or learn the lake. And some of them is, is a, you know, 30 day cutoff. So 30 days prior to the tournament starting, you can't be on the on the lake at all. You can't get oh, any really? information. Yeah. And a lot of them now have gone to where once the once the schedule is announced, you can't get any information from any buddies, any locals. Because, yeah, I mean, it, and it's happened with me. I mean, you, you show up to practice in a wrapped boat, wrapped truck, you know, and you got locals that will come up to you and just start giving you information. I mean, they'll want, because they want you to do well in the tournament so that they can go back and brag to their buddies that, oh man, you know, Jamie finished well in that tournament. Yeah, I helped him out. I gave him some of my points. I gave I, him the Z yeah, spot, yeah. man. Oh yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So it's- So you, you know, can't even like, if that conversation happens, are you having to be like, hey, I can't, you can't give me yep. any information? Yeah, you gotta say, hey, I, I, you know, I appreciate it. I bet they you have know, moles, don't they, yeah, from the tournament. Oh, like, I wouldn't doubt Those bass it. club yeah. boys, huh? Yeah. Dude, yeah. These tournaments are way more intricate than I thought. I thought yeah. you just go cast a rod and catch stuff. There's moles and spies and game oh, wardens. Dude, yeah. and, it's it it is it's crazy, but it's it's fun. I mean, I it's you know for me, you know, continually doing it. It's that competition aspect. You know, I'm retired now. Um, I retired in December of fourteen, and like everybody, when you know when you leave, when you retire, you you you're trying to find something. You're still trying to find purpose in life. You know, because after I mean, I did twenty one years. It was all in special operations, and you know, fourteen deployments to combat. I mean, I was it was just hard and heavy, back to back to back to back, go, 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 go. Then you retire and you're like, all right, yeah, time to sit back on the couch and do nothing, watch TV, drink beer. 
So you, know, you can't I, I, do that. I have, yeah. I have a question for you then, because I think a lot of things that I've discussed, and, and it's from a microcosmic level comparatively to you because you retired, but that transition aspect of service, you know, how, how did you kind of work through that retirement, kind of all the purpose and sense of brotherhood that you had and, and that, how did you, did you surround yourself by similar people and keep in that community and then go obviously bass fishing has helped from like a communal level. Like what was the main key to success? Cause I think there's a lot of guys and gals out there that do even four years, six years in the military and they get out and their sense of purpose, their sense of community is completely lost and it can be hyper challenging. And a lot of times is misdiagnosed as PTS when it's actually just a support system mechanism that is failing to function in their life, right. but they kind of need that boost to be like, yeah, Let me go find some shit. I, the the biggest thing I would say to anybody as they're getting ready to get out, and it doesn't matter if you've only done four years or you've done twenty four years or thirty years, you know we we all know that when you're serving and you're in the military, you're different than everybody else out there. Even if you know at the four year mark you come out and you're just like, yeah, I'm different than these other people out here. Um, when before you get out, find something, find have a plan, find some hobby. Find something that you just enjoy to do and start building on that and, and, and getting involved in that prior to getting out. Because if you don't, I mean, generally, as soon as you get out, everybody, not to say everybody, but once you get out, you, you kind of want to do nothing for a little while. You know, you're like, I've been just been told what to do. But don't uh, do yeah. that because I got back paid $12,000 when I got out for BAH and I did nothing for four months and burnt all of that money. <laughs> and I was like, well, that was fucking stupid. <laughs> I better get a job so I could pay rent. <laughs> yeah. Um, have something to do. I mean, you know, for me, it was fishing. I, I knew and I, and I built that as I was getting ready to retire, like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm walking out, you know, of the unit and I'm going fishing full time. And I dove right into bass fishing and saltwater fishing. I mean, I was, I was gone probably more that year than I had been deployed, um, in the previous year. Just Instead of ISIS, it was bass. That is, <laughs> yeah. They were, yeah, they were my mortal enemy. Um, so you, you have to have something, you've got to have something. And, you know, I mean, for some guys, it's just simple, like woodworking, you know, yeah. or it's, it's, you know, painting. I, I don't care what it is. You, everybody has a hobby, you know, and, and there's guys, and, you know, you look at me coming from the background I did where, you know, people are like, you did that and now you're bass fishing. And, you know, there's another dude that I served with, um, Louis, uh, he races motorcycles you know, and he is freaking damn good at it. I mean, he, every time he is on the podium, uh, yeah. but that's his, that's his gig, you know, that's his outlet. And, and you build a brotherhood doing that, you know, the, all the guys, I mean, it, it's, I relate some of the guys that I bass fish with and travel with, and, and I have a tight knit group of guys that we share information and, you know, there's similar personalities, the guys that I was in with, you know, and it just, it just helps with that whole relationship. And I, I like that a lot. It's, it's super simple, but it's like, do something. Cause you know, the old saying like idle hands are the devil's worship. I think that's a lot of the problem I've seen in some of the guys and gals in community. It's they, they do nothing and you don't have to find that career path for the next 20 years of your life. Maybe you go try fishing for six months and you're like, I'm over it, but at least you got to do something, learn a new skill, kind of learn about yourself. Cause I think you don't really learn a lot about yourself in the military because it's like one mission and then you got barracks, you got BA, you got the med like everything's kind of taken care of you. It's a very inclusive um, experience. And then right. when you're kind of pulled out of that, you're like, oh, I have to do a lot of things that were kind of just given to me because the mission came first. And now the mission is my happiness. And you kind of got to sort that yourself. But I, I like that perspective of just getting out and doing something. Yep. Have yeah. some plan. And listening to you kind of talk about that reminds me of something that Tyler Gray said in this TED talk he did up when we were in Washington. And he was kind of providing his view on like the traditional take on what it's like to get out of the military and, and the whole PTSD stigma. And he was saying how through this one experience he had where he was kind of witness to this fire situation stateside was that it hit him. It was like, it wasn't so much that it was like post-traumatic stress disorder, but it was this post-traumatic post-traumatic lack of adrenaline disorder. And hearing you say that, like when you were talking about fishing, you were like, there's adrenaline right off the bat, man. There's adrenaline in your buddy who, who's now racing motorcycles. How big of a deal is that a 
coming from your type of background and like finding something in civilian life where you're still getting some type of adrenaline and rush. I think it's important if if you had that in the military, because there's obviously we know plenty of guys that were in the military and either rode a desk or were a mechanic or, you know, and they, they're not adrenaline junkies. You know I mean? We are adrenaline junkies. We love that. So having your outlet mirror some of that, I think is very important. Um, but you know, it may not be for everybody. Um, you just got to figure out, you know, what do you need for yourself? And I mean, the other side of it too, is like, you're, you're going to have some issues. You, 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 there's no way, you know, even, even what I had, I, I feel like I built a great plan and I had, you know, my, my fishing, which was my therapy, you know, on days that I'm just like, man, fuck the world. Um, you know, fucking everything's bullshit. I don't want to hear anything that's going on, you know, especially nowadays with it. Dude, I don't even listen yeah. to the radio anymore. I don't, I mean, I don't listen. I don't watch the news. I don't, you know, I try not to even pay attention to it because it just pisses me off. But when you have those days, I mean, I was able to just go fishing and go fun fishing or just be out in nature. Um, you know, on the days where I'm competing, I mean, I have that adrenaline piece to it, but you're still going to have, you're still going to have some issues. So you're not alone. That's the biggest thing. And it, it I mean, a light bulb went off, you know, I was still, I was still in the unit and I mean, it was probably after my 10th or 11th deployment, my wife was starting to notice some issues with me and I didn't want to say anything and nobody wants to say anything because the last thing you want is to get pulled off a team, not deploy. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that you're like, well, I, I, I need to fix myself and okay, I'm going to go do this. It was, well, I don't want to let my buddies down. You know, nobody else is saying anything if they have issues. And if we get called tomorrow, I'm not going to be the guy that's not there. You know, so you're, you're sucking it up for your buddies, um, but you're suffering, your family's suffering, you know, you're having all these issues. So once I finished my team leader time, um, and I went to our, which are like research and development, uh, you know, doing, that's where I got into more of the, the lasers and, and night vision and all this aspect, which is a whole nother subject. I finally went to the docs and I'm like, Hey, I got some issues. And the first words out of their mouth were, you're not alone. They're like you, you we can't tell you names, but like, you'd be surprised at how many guys that, yeah are, are come in here and, and need help, you know, so let's get you set up. Let's, you know, talk to the doc, let's, you know, figure out what we need to do and, you know, start, start getting you better, figure out exactly what's going on. And that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me to go, wait, really? Like other dudes yeah. are having this issue, you know, cause well, in large, you don't right, want to raise your hand. It's part of the culture that makes, um, you know, special operations units so effective and efficient is it's like mission first. And then sometimes that can snowball and just devastate family life, home life. And you, you hear it coming out of a lot of guys that have been on those plus 10 deployment cycles because that's a decade of deploying into direct combat. And you never looked out for yourself. It was always the teammates first. And that, that's a great point. And, there, and there, the good thing with that, I think a lot of the units are recognizing that now. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention a lot of resources on the side as far as nonprofits actually working with government grants to get people in like Warriors Heart Foundation with Tom Spooner. And if they have an alcohol problem because they turned to self-medication because they were, didn't want to be the guy that raised their hand. I mean, I have a specific example we did a post deployment thing and you had to fill out that like weird paper. And it's like, have you ever felt in just like ones and all right? Like I'm a fucking badass. Yeah, yeah. And there was one dude who, uh, they kind of pulled him like, Hey, can we go speak to you? And the whole platoon just made fun of this guy behind his back. Cause we we're like fucking pussy at the time. That's what I thought. And then in retrospect, I'm like, there's a chance that that dude, cause we had a nasty deployment that he, probably might just need to go chat with somebody. Right. And that could be completely acceptable because I would prefer him to be back healthy and in a good mental space so the team's efficient and we all come back alive. So yeah, if, if guys and gals are thinking that, like use the resources available. Don't don't feel like you're being deterred by doing that. Yeah, and you, you hit the nail on the head. There's so many organizations out there now that are there to, to help. You just, I mean, you have to take the first step and just raise your hand and just say, hey, uh, something's not right. But know that, you're not alone. You know, there's myself included, you know, there's plenty of guys that have had issues, you know, still deal with some issues, but have gotten the help or figured out, okay, this is what's wrong. And, and, and now I've fixed it. And now life is great. Family life is great. You know, I mean, props to my wife for 
for hanging on for as long as she did. I mean, we've been married 25 years plus. And those wives are real good at tolerating her shit, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, they are. She's, well, dude, a, she's you, a master at it. Yeah, you think about like, you know, I, I can only imagine the level of competition that exists within the demographic that you were a part of. Like, you, you don't get a day off. Like 20 years, you do not get a single day off because even if you're stateside and you're in training mode, it's like that level of competition is still there. It's just inner team at that point. And so that just has to wear on you eventually, especially when you do it for 20 plus years. Yeah, you never, you never come down. You know, it's funny because I was just having this conversation with a guy that I, that I do some teaching and some training with. We, we were just up and of course, after every night of, of training, we went back to the hotel and we're sitting there drinking some bourbon and bullshit. And then, um, we were, we got on the subject about, you know, how we were sleeping, you know, at the hotel. And I was like, man, you know, I, I usually sleep the best at a hotel and it's because I can actually switch off. Like nobody knows I'm here. You know, like when I'm at home, I'm still like on alert. Even when I sleep, you know, I want to kind of sleep lightly. You know, I want to make sure I can still defend my home and, you know, this and this and this. My family's there. When I get on the road and I'm in a hotel, I'm just literally like, yes, I can turn off. I don't have to do anything. I thought it was the only weirdo. Every time I travel, I'm in a hotel. (laughs) We have the Salt Lake City same shit. I was like, man, I have not slept like this in months because I'm like, Oh, I just do what I want. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But it's, 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 you can finally turn off. You know, because you, just like you said, for 20 something years, you're switched on the entire time and it doesn't matter. You know, you can never come down because, you know, when you're on deployment, you're, you're, you're firing at a hundred the entire time. Even when you come home, it's like, well, okay, I'm home. Cool. But now I'm protecting my home. Now I'm training. All right. Hey, now we're going off on this training trip. I mean, I'm still on, you know, alert. Uh, I mean, just, you know, you don't, the phone could ring at any point and it's like, okay, hey, we're going to the next country. So it's, yeah, it is. You're, you're just, mind is up there racing the entire time. And then you've, um, so let's talk about one minute out, right? So what is that? That's So that one minute out is my company that I started a couple of years ago. Um, started it off as, you know, wanting to build it as a brand and wanting it to be where kind of people see the logo, see the name and it sort of motivates them. So one minute out, right? Everybody initially, they're like, dude, that's a cool name. That's awesome. I love the logo. You know, it's like a number one. It kind of looks like a military patch tab across the top says one minute out, you know, it's got a nice one in there. And, um, I want people to quickly, easily recognize it. And, you know, the tagline is live like you're one minute out. So, easy example for those that have been in the military, you know, you're getting ready to go out on target and we're smoking and joking. You know, if we were on the bird together, you know, in flight, we know we're going into the hornet's nest. Like this is a known, you know, bad guy safe house. There's like, you know, ISRs up above. There's 12 dudes there. You know, it's two in the morning. They're all still up. We can see guns. We're like, yeah, let's go get some. But on the flight in, you know, I'm probably pulling the cable out of the back of Matt's battery pack on his nods. You know, maybe if he's sitting his gun there, unscrewing, you know, making his his EOTech battery cap loose. I'm just, you know, you're messing with each other the whole time, still in route. But as soon as you get that one minute call, it's like you flip a switch internally and it's like, okay, you know, go through your final gear checks. Everything's good. You've memorized, you know, the, the GRG, you've memorized what the, the target building looks like, the layout, the face of the dude that you're going after, you know, whatever it is, you're ready. You're firing at hundred percent. You know, you're just, you're ready to go. You're, you're shooting on all cylinders and it's, it's, you know, live like that all the time. So not only, you know, most of us just at points, you know, you're sort of moping through life and, oh yeah, I got this to do or that to do. But when you're one minute out from that task and even as civilians, you know, whether it's you're going in to give a briefing to, you know, the board of directors, when you're one minute out, you're done. Like you're prepped, you're ready. You are like firing, you've memorized that presentation, you're ready to go nail it. So live like that all the time. Not, not to add to your brand identity, but I think this is kind of segues to the purpose thing you were talking about earlier. But it's interesting for me that people that have, whether you're a civilian or anything, it's maybe not always the one minute out, but they never have that feeling of being one minute out. And it's like, I think that that's important for a lot of people to chase, whether like, I feel that when we're getting ready to go do content or shooting a commercial, I'm like, I got to have all my fucking 
ducks in the row. I got to make sure this is great. Probably similar to you when you're that countdown one minute out before the boats get released to start the tournament. Like, I think that's a good aspect to chase that one minute out feeling of, I want to be, I want to feel alive. I just want to be like existing because the blood's rushing to your head and your heart and you're like adrenaline's pumping and your brain's firing. Like that's fucking living, man. And, I, and it's unfortunate that people don't have that. And, and hopefully people can pursue that through what you guys are doing and, and inspirational stuff you've done over the years. Cause Fuck, man, that's the whole point of life is to live. Oh, it is. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> but yeah, and part of the logo is that one like MO, one, one mo, one more. So always striving for one more. You know, mm-hmm. don't don't just settle for, okay, yep, hey, I did this. No, you know, strive for for that that additional. Always go for one more. Yeah. Do you feel like you kind of get even and I know your company is kind of themed towards the tactical side of things, but do you, do you get kind of the same feeling when you're doing the bass fishing stuff? Like completely. When, when so, you're like, ah, like I feel like this cast, like I kind of yeah, feel so it. Yeah, so just right like Matt there. said, I mean, prior to blast off, you, you're amped, you know, your you know, first, second, third spots you're going to run, you know, and in your mind, you're like, yep, they're going to bite. You know, I got the right baits tied on. I mean, the knots are good. The line is good. I mean, everything is prepped and ready. And then the other cool thing is, you know, in the bass tournament, you, I mean, you're out there for eight hours and there's times throughout the day, you know, if you're not catching them or things change and you're just like, oh man, you know, I'm not catching them today. The, if you can stay motivated and still treat it like you're running to that first spot and the day's just starting every time you move and go to a new spot. I mean, just, just having that mental edge throughout that day helps. And then the other, I mean, the other thing that, you know, when I started the company up, was like, well, this could go to the fishing side or it could go to the tactical side. You know, part of the logo in the one has like a barb in it, like a hook. Yeah. And another feeling that we get is right prior to the day ending. So, you know, I got to be in at three o'clock. Like I've, I've got to be back at the check-in place by three o'clock. My key fob's got to be back in the net. You know, I'm checked in, I'm good. But you're at your last spot, which, you know, you make that Hail Mary run. You're like, okay, I got 30 minutes left. Where's my best place? I think I could catch a big one or, you know, catch a couple, whatever it is I need, you're there and you are so focused and so dialed in on your bait, feeling everything it's doing because you're, I mean, you're mentally trying to just make a fish bite it. You know, you're like, I need one more, you know, <laughs> I need one more fish. I need one more bite. And in that last few minutes, I mean, you're watching the clock and I'm one of the dudes that I'm throwing my key fob in that net and there's maybe a second to spare. Yeah. I mean, I fish till the absolute bitter end because I've had it happen where you, you know, you're on that last spot and you're making one last cast and there you go. You just yeah. caught the one that bumped you five, 10 places. Or, I mean, I've had it happen where I won a tournament. The very last spot, I mean, I ran from way up a lake all the way back. I'm watching the time and I mean, I'm running my bass cat as hard as I can. I get all the way back to weigh in. I look and I'm like, dude, there's two minutes to go. I was like, I'm not turning in my key fob. There's a creek. I look at my map real quick. I'm like, ah, that's similar. I pull into this cut and I'm just, I'm switched on. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to make this happen. And I pull up on a point and it was like second cast, catch one, flip it in the boat. Okay. There's my smallest, get rid of it, make it back in within seconds to spare. And I won the tournament by two ounces. I mean, oh, it was that fish yeah. right there. If I would have just been like, oh man, uh, two minutes to go. Ah, let me just go in. I wouldn't have won the tournament. You know, that's the difference between at that, you know, at that time it was like, uh, I think I, you know, it was like a BFL. So I, I think I had won about seven, eight grand versus a couple grand, you know, yeah. second place. I mean, that was that's huge. an expensive ass fish. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. So it was so worth just that extra, you know, but it, again, it was just, I was living like I was one minute out throughout the whole day. I mean, it's like, nope, I got time. You know, let's go. Let's make a fish bite right now. What, what do you guys actually do at one minute out? Is it tactical training, civilian courses? So we, yeah. So it's, um, I mean, the website, one minute out.com. I've got some swag on there, uh, a few shirts and uh, trying to get some hats done, um, stickers, patches, the normal, the normal swag, but tactical training. So I've got um, private classes. So if guys are interested in private stuff, just, you know, just hit me up. Uh, you can hit me up through the website or just jc at one minute out.com. Um, night vision training was kind of like where it started. So back up a little bit to the the tail part of my career. After I finished my team time, I went to our research development section and did um, VAS, so visual augmentation systems, night vision, lasers, weapon sights, and scopes. So I was, you know, 
part of the whole fusion goggle, pano goggle, the new mount we have, um, developing the Hellstar 6 strobe light that we run on our helmet. I mean, anything that had to do with night vision or something that went to an operator's eye. I mean, I had a $10 million budget a year to make stuff better or completely go to manufacturers and make something that didn't exist. You know, if we had a mission set and it's like, hey, we need something and this doesn't exist to make this mission better. For example, you know, the army still issues that MS 2000 strobe. It's a green little flat box. You slide up on it and yeah, it blinks. Word, yeah. yeah. Word on the back of my helmet. Yeah. All the time. So, and this was me, I'm sure similar to you. We go to do some like night jump ops and we have to have a white strobe to illuminate our canopy stateside. And I'm taping and Velcroing this thing, which is flat onto a curved helmet. And I'm like, this is the dumbest shit ever. Yeah, those things fall. Yeah. You like yeah. You try to Velcro it I'm, this way and they're doing yeah, like, a, I'm like an X on it. Yeah. I'm like, why has somebody yeah. not made something that actually is shaped to the helmet? Because we put this strobe light on our helmet Are all the damn time. you telling me you helped make the new one? Yeah. So oh. the Hellstar 6, right? Four function strobe light, a core survival makes. That's when I got to CDD, I'm like, I'm going to fix this problem. This is one of the things that I'm going to do. Cool. So I got up with uh, the owner, Marsha Baldwin at Core Survival and was like, hey, here's what I want to do. She's like, no problem. We'll do it. So we developed a four function light. So it has four different modes, two of them usually IR, two and overt, but any different color combination, brightness, flash rates, tweak the whole thing. I mean, it's it's awesome. You can reprogram it and make it different colors for whatever your mission is. Um, so I helped develop that. But all of that stuff that I was doing, um, you know, in that's where I really started to learn a lot more about night vision, like the technical aspect, obviously through my whole career spent under night vision using lasers and just sort of took for granted how much knowledge and experience I had with that. Now I got out, I have my company and I was getting hit up a lot by um, some government agencies and law enforcement, like SWAT teams that were just starting to utilize night vision. They wanted training. They're begging for it. So they're like, yeah, I mean, some of them so bad that they're like, yeah, we, we've got night vision. We've, you know, we got like eight sets of PVS 14s. They're sitting in a closet locked and nobody will let us use them because we have no training on it. Nobody knows how to use it or we haven't had any formal training. So legally, you know, they don't even want to deal with that legal aspect of something happening. No, because if they make a mistake, there has to be a training document. Well, you we went through the proper procedures. Exactly. And had the training. Yeah, of course. So that's what I started up. So my, I've got multiple night vision classes. One of them is just a two day operator class. Um, I have a three day class and then a three day train the trainer class, which is what I just wrapped up up there in Fort Worth at range 35. And we we got NTOA, so the National Tactical Officers Association, which is a huge um, organization for all the SWAT teams in the U.S. I mean, they they help them legally, they help them with training, like certify them, give them all those documents and and training so that they're legal. I mean, they have different levels of SWAT teams. They I developed a fifty five round night qualification, so an actual like night qualification shoot, they adopted it and they blessed off on it saying, yeah, this is legit. Um, we, we will back this. So when guys come through my course, not only do they get two days worth of two or three days worth of great training, the knowledge on all the gear, we put them through tons of different shooting drills. They shoot that 55 round night qual, and then they leave with a certificate for completion of the course and another certificate saying everything they've been trained on and that they passed and what they scored on that night qual. So in the case of something were to happen, you know, on a on an objective or whatever, and they've got to stand in front of the red carpet because, you know, the lawyers are going to try to hang them out to dry. Nope, look, I've been trained. I even qualified with my weapon system, with my nods, with my laser. You know, they've got the documents to, to you know, to help them out and, and do everything. That, so That's awesome, man, because it is a completely different world. Like your shooting mechanics, your position of your weapon, your laser discipline. It is completely different under night vision. I mean, I think everybody thinks you're like looking through an optic. It's like half the time you're freaking hip firing it or like low shoulder firing it because yep. you have a really stable platform and you're using your laser. And then how are you zeroing your laser and confirming laser with your EOTech and off paper and on paper? Like a lot of things like, oh, yeah. You know, you is, like old tricks that you have, like I do like went right to would be far distance because I was a master breacher then coming up, but I always put my hand out. So when I got to the breach door under nods, I could do demo with left eye and then right eye would be my clear mm -hmm. eye. That way you're not like having to pop up knobs and just, yep. there's so many efficiencies there that if you didn't have iteration after iteration, you would never know unless you right. had a great trainer. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And we go through, we go through, I mean, even our two day class, every time we finish it, we're just like, 
man, the, 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 I mean, we pack so much information in just two days. I mean, I, I even hate to do it in two days only because we're, they're drinking from the fire hose, you know, and it's, we give them, I try to give every bit of my knowledge I can out to these guys. And it's, you know, all those little things. I mean, we teach them how to zero with their laser. We teach them a tough, couple different methods of it. I teach them, you know, the simplest method and I show them, I'm like, look, you don't need some fancy zero target. You just need a piece of paper. You know, I'll show you exactly how to, see what your offset is for your gear, for your equipment, for your laser, what the offset is. All right, we're going to do a parallel zero versus point A and point of impact. I mean, you, all of it. Yeah. And even like, where's your, your, your pec mounted on your yep. thing? Cause you're going to have muzzle and sight difference between a standard optic, which would be high and low comparatively if it's on the right mount. And then you're going to have a different yep. vertical. It's there's so much and in that. Like, so I'm going to touch on that one really quick. Okay. And this is the biggest thing that see so many kids miss, by the way. Oh, okay. I'm like, you idiot. They're like, well, yeah. Sergeant, you told me to hold high. I'm like on your fucking EO. Tech, man. <laughs> yes. So here, here's the biggest thing I put out and tell, and, and it's got it's gotten better. And I uh we actually wrote wrote like a paper that I think we're gonna we're gonna submit so the article can go out, but just just setting your gun up for night operations. The biggest thing I can say off the bat is if you have any type of an aiming laser, put it at 12 o'clock, put it on top of your rail. Yeah. I know you're limited on space and different things in different places, but if you look at every single laser that's out there, whether it's an L3 product, whether it's a Wilcox product, whether it's BE Myers, a D-ball, they're all set up to be mounted on top because it gets you your laser as close to bore as possible. Mm -hmm. So that puts it as closest to the barrel as possible. And if you look at, I mean, this is just dummy proof, all the adjustments left, right, up, down I was, are dude, on it. I was, so it's I was just gonna say, 12 o'clock. Have you ever got that? I used to have privates and they like, sorry, I think my PEC 15 is broken. I'm, it's going down instead of left. I'm like, because yeah. it's mounted on the right, you yeah. shithead. <laughs> like, yes. I'm, oh, I'm just man. making fun. But, they yeah. wouldn't yeah. even let us mount it on the right or left really? because we're dumb. And that's why we call <laughs> Barney proof. It had to go on top of the roof. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's where it should be. Yeah. That right. puts the laser as closest to bore as possible and it makes it easy to adjust. Yeah. yeah, that's, that works, man. I mean, that's, that's the same as, I mean, the other thing that we talk about in, in all my classes, cause we, we, even in the night vision class, we're going to shoot our day site first. We're going to make sure everybody's zeroed before we even start doing any shooting. And then we get into the night stuff. But even on, you know, your zero for the day site, you know, I talk about, I'm a big fan of the 5200 zero. So it's the flattest shooting. Um, the army is big on the 25300. And I'm like, well, the reason why is you've got a whole company of guys that you've got to get zeroed in one day, right? So try putting them out at 50 and trying to even get them to group is gonna take you a week to do that. So stick them all as close as you possibly can to the target, let them shoot three rounds and go, okay, well, there's the center of your group. Let's just go ahead and move it over a little bit and call you good. Right. But we all know when we went through basic and you shoot, you zero at 25, which you are barely given that bullet any time to do anything when it leaves the barrel at 25. And then you're gonna supposedly hit some target at 300. And how many times are guys actually hitting that bitch at 300? It's like, oh, I'm kicking up the dirt or I'm, yeah. I don't even see it. You're way off left or right. Cause even at 25, I mean, if, if you're not shooting a super tight group and can make any type of adjustment, you know, even if you go and shoot that at hundred now, you're gonna see some type of left or right in there yeah. because that bullet finally has some time to do what right. the input is that you've, that you've given on it. So yeah, and the other thing with that 5,200, and, and the light bulb goes off when I talk to guys about it is, you know, what is, what is the most likely thing that's going to happen when shit hits the fan and whether it's a law enforcement guy, you know, a SWAT guy, a military dude, you know, majority of them haven't been in a ton of firefights, haven't had bullets zinging at them. When shit hits the fan, whether it's their day site or it's their laser, they're going to go, holy shit, somebody's shooting at me. They're going to put their dot right on that guy's chest and start and start slinging around. Yeah. So giving that whole travel of the bullet and the offset as, as little bit of tra over travel or under or offset you can, you're more likely to hit the target. Where if, you know, it's rare that somebody's going to go, oh, that guy's shooting at me. Okay, I have a 50-0. That guy is 75 yards. So my bullet is now going to be a little bit high. Yeah. So let me aim a little low. And yeah, no, it's going to be, holy shit daughter laser right in the chest and start slinging them. Well, I think that's one of like, the most famous stories that came out of like the Mogadishu time um, Operation Gothic Serpent was a lot of the Rangers were zeroed at 
300 and they're trying to take shorter shots and there's like, they're hitting crazy high or crazy low, however they had it. And it was like never that kind of training perspective of muzzle, muzzle site relationship. And then Mm -hmm. where that zero hits and then you're having the arc and the drop of it. Like there's a lot of visceral understanding. I think you have to have on a weapons platform, the bullet you're shooting, your optics. I mean, it is. And I think that's why it's so important for guys and gals that are going out as a profession that the, the thing is, you may never use that in a 20 year career, may or never get a gun and fine, but it only takes one time. And you have to set yourself up for success because that is the absolute difference between you dying and, and saving yourself and or a teammate. And to me, that 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 is absolutely something you should be training on an active basis. So, cause you're not like exactly what you said, you're gonna go down to that muscle memory, pick up a gun, chest, let's go. But if you've gone through range iteration and put yourself under stress, you're, you're, you're more likely to make a better decision. Yeah, definitely. I mean, get out there and you know, everybody that comes to my classes, I mean, I, big thing is look, go to as many classes as you can. Go train with as many instructors as you can. Um, just have the common sense to say, okay, you know, that was good. That wasn't so much. And, you know, you're going to pull something from every instructor. Don't just go to one and drink the Kool-Aid 100% right. because we all teach things a little bit different. Um, you know, you can't just go in and drink it. And I, I see, unfortunately, a lot of law enforcement guys that will go off to some training course and next thing you know, they're changing all their tactics. You know, they went from doing a low carry now, you know, they go to Darcy and it's like all high port, you know, running through things. And yeah, yeah, don't get me started on that one. But, you know- Uh, Would you agree at least? I think it's a good thing because like- six, five, six years ago, the tactical industry was just swamped with these like instructors that had no real life combat experience. And it was like, how do I make this look sexy? And I'm not even poking fun, they're businessmen. But the problem is, is like, I'd rather learn from a guy like you or guys that have been out deployed multiple, multiple times. They're like, this is a method. It's not, it's not law. And I think that too often people, cause I've been to so many shooting courses and I've seen shit work for my friends that I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? But they're, they're, they're nailing it where I'm yep. like, I carry my gun a little different. Cause I pulled mm-hmm. from this instructor and kind of made like a, a whole different system for myself. Yep. Yeah. That, and that's exactly what you have to do. Go, go train with as many as you can, but pull what works for you. And that's what I preach. I'm like, look, I'm showing you a way not the way. Yeah. It is a way. And I mean, I keep my classes small. My rifle pistol class that I just did, I had seven dudes in it. Oh, I wow. had a bunch of guys on the waiting list that wanted to get in, but I just, I told them no. I'm like, look, that's all I want because that is enough where guys aren't standing around as we're doing and going through different drills, but I can spend a lot of one-on-one time with yeah. guys and fix or or work on things that they want to work on. Because you get 20 guys and yeah, could I do 20 guys? Sure, I could. I could make a bunch of money doing that. But what are they getting out of it? That's what I'm more concerned about. It's like, I want you to have a good experience. I want you to come to my class knowing like, hey, I want to work on this, this, or this, or this is where I'm weak. And I actually have the time to work with you and fix you and get you faster, get you more accurate, whatever your goal was. So you you get out there, train as much as you absolutely can, train as many people as you can, but have some common sense in what you do. And then you know, a, a, some good feedback I got from this last class. A lot of guys love, I, I put out this like 90, 10 rule. And for me, what I continually preach is set your gear up, do the thing that whatever you're going to do and, and take from each instructor, you're never going to have that hundred percent solution. Like your gear is never going to be 100% perfect for every situation, but think about what are you doing, what is your job, whether you're a law enforcement SWAT guy or you're just a competition shooter or whatever, or you're just an everyday carry type of guy, that's it. You know, you just wanna go to a pistol class and learn, you know, more things that are gonna help you with your everyday carry. Not what is the 90% solution for how you're gonna be shooting or doing those things, you know, 90% of the time. That 10% of the time, make sure that you can access it. You know, for example, like in a night vision class, how you have your rifle set up, where your pressure pads are, how you access your laser and your white light. Is there a way possibly to perfectly have it so you could quickly do it, you know, both ways? Yeah, but you may end up with a ton more gear on your gun than you actually need. Just set it up for that 90% solution, which for me yeah. is, you know, I'm a right-handed shooter. So I set my gun up primarily for my right hand, you know, to shoot from my right side. But that 10% of the time, I may have to switch and shoot off my left shoulder. Can I still access my laser and my and my white light with my right hand now, you know, out forward? I can do it. It's not sexy and as fast. I could add another pressure pad here or there and make it that fast. But 
now I'm adding more stuff on my gun that I really don't need, or I only yeah. need that 10% of the time. So set your gear up, you know, work your training so that you're you're fast and you're efficient for that 90% solution, but have workarounds for that 10% and practice it on the range. I, I completely agree. I, I get a lot of questions on like the concealed handgun and stuff. And it's it's always like, what's the best concealed carry gun? And I'm like, you start with the one that you're down to carry every day. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's one for me because wherever you can legally carry it, you should be carrying a gun. And if you want your sexy 1911 with your RMR on top, like, are you really wearing that in board shorts? And it's like, start right. there. And then you can kind of get it to where you, you can carry it every day and you're good with it and proficient with it and all of that. But yeah, it seems like a lot of people just want shit to look cool rather than making it practical. Oh, but well, that's the fault of yeah, the internet I mean, that's just, right that's just life, right? YouTube, social media. The whole, huh, huh, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. yeah. The, ra the range. We'll go yeah, offline correct. in that and have a good ranting oh, session. Yeah, we will. But yeah, that'll be a good one. Did you see that there was one video of this? I think he was a Russian guy and he was, he had like paper targets up on all four sides of him. And he was doing this like underarm behind the back. Instructor Zero? No, it wasn't Instructor. It was uh -huh. more recently. Yeah. I saw one recently where they were on an indoor range shooting and there was an instructor between the students and the target. Oh, and he pulled the gun on him? No, he's walking back and forth like a rabbit and like stopping and then moving and like oh, in front of these guys shooting to challenge them to, I mean, I get it. Like make sure your eyes are open when you're shooting, you're aware of your surroundings, no tunnel vision. But I'm like, who's the unlucky dude that drew the straw to be the rabbit yeah. and go back and, and forth? And Jake, yeah. you are range monkey today. Go down at 15 yards and jump around like a freaking, what was the old uh, frogger? He's like the, the bullet frogger, man. No, dude, no thanks. It was nuts. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me right now. I mean, you're just asking to get shot. Yeah. And then who's at fault? You, you dumbass, you're standing downrange trying to get shot. Yeah. I'm like, the stuff that's out there is, it blows my mind. That's why, I, that's why I can't get onto social media and just start scrolling through stuff or, uh, yeah, I'll lose my mind at what's out there in the training and the, oh. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, fake it till you make it kind of guys out there. But but with that said, there's a lot of phenomenal, amazing instructors. You just kind of got to look at it, vet their background, see what the class feedback was like you mm -hmm. and um, plenty of other like sheepdog response. And th there's just so many good, good training people out there, but there's a lot of trash. So you got to, yeah. yeah, you got to weed, weed through it and yeah. yeah, make sure you spend your money in, in the right location. Yeah. Well, shit, man. I'm going to make you uncomfortable real quick. All right, let's uh, do I, I just want to say thank you for everything, man. Like the, the world needs uh, great Americans like you and uh, your service and, and what you're doing um, at one minute out training guys and gals. And then uh, we're, we're glad to have you part of Black Rifle family. So thank you. Keep cool. kicking ass, wow. dude. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Um, appreciate you guys having me out here. And yeah, it's it's been a blast. It's been a ride. I'm I'm happy to be part of the family and continue to, to spread the good word and and Logan and I have one shit talking thing to say. When are you, you going to take us fishing, man? Dude, yeah, let's I, go. I, I, somebody already said there's like a creek back there. Yeah, it's right there. There's some bass down there. Yeah. The rods do it. and tackle is in my. You think I don't travel without rods and tackle? Dude, it's, it's right, right there, man. Yeah. Let's have a little contest, see who can catch the first one. Oh. I'll blame it on having <laughs> a torn bicep. Why can't you set the hook? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, let everybody know uh, one more time where they can find you on. Online. Uh, yeah, you can hit me up uh, directly, JC, just the letter J, C, my initials, Jamie Caldwell, uh, JC at one minute out.com or one minute out.com is my website. It's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of reworking it and revamping it, getting a guy to, to kind of totally rebuild it. But my swag is up there, my training classes. I got to, I've been so busy with training and fishing uh, these last couple months that I got to get my 2021 20, schedule up there. But keep your eyes peeled for it. And, uh, they fill up quick. So if you want to get in on one, then you can do it through the website. But yeah, that's 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 me in a nutshell. Cool. Well, Kick thanks so much, you. Jamie. Yeah, yeah appreciate thanks it. Thanks for uh, listening to Free Range American. We'll see you next show, right? Bye.